kiss me gently. So I'm chasing the eclipse. Chase has been playing guitar with me for about nine months now. About that, yeah. Yeah. Chinsia in the Eclipse is basically a solo project of all closeted songs that I've been hiding for years now. Um, and I've worked in music for about three years. So it's kind of been like collecting and growing to like a whole new extent to a point where I think I, I took some time to get comfortable with myself, which made me get comfortable with my music and the art that I was making, which brought Chase into the picture and we started playing together and he basically zhushes it up and embellishes what I write musically and melodically. For me, I started on like all like the, the classic rock and heavy metal kind of stuff. Uh, that's where my kind of love for it started. I um, remember uh, being sat down by my dad. He showed me some ACDC music videos and he's like, this is real music, Chase. <laughs> um, and I remember hearing it and I was like, that's really cool. And then the first time I saw Angus from ACDC on a screen, like I didn't even know what a guitar was, what he was doing. I'm like, I just, I want that thing. Like that is what I want. And uh, then from there, just kind of sprawled out to dive into the heavier side of things for a bit. And then I always kind of loved pop, but it was like kind of like a guilty pleasure. I'm like, I can't really tell people I like pop music because it's not cool. If you're in, <laughs> in rock and metal to do that, like, you don't do that. But uh, as I got older, I just stopped caring about like those kinds of ideas and um, and just evolved from the classic rock and stuff. And now my phone will go from ACDC to Taylor Swift like that. Um. I think for me, I first really got into music with country music. I'm not even gonna lie. My dad is a very big country music fan, so we'd be in the car like listening to like Garth Brooks or Faith Hill, and it's just like songs that I ended up picking up and getting into. And honestly, I think that's where a lot of like my uh, songwriting stems from is like that country side of things. But then growing up, I got really into like classic rock because I wanted to be really cool and badass. So I'd like listen to ACDC on my front steps with like a boombox and just think I was cool because I was like blasting my music. I think I I've come very comfortable with the fact that I know I'm a very impressionable person. So growing up, my older sister would play a lot of like indie rock from the UK, like um, the Kooks, Arctic Monkeys. I got into Catfish and the Bottleman, but it was just that whole scene that really like kind of grabbed me. And I just liked the whole the whole movement that was coming from the UK with that. And you know, it made me start playing guitar at like 12 years old. I sucked the first time I played an instrument. It was so bad. <laughs> it was so bad that I stopped. My guitar teacher was actually missing two fingers. And I, in my head, like a 12 year old little kid, I'm like, how the hell are you gonna teach me how to play guitar? You can't, but he was amazing though. Like still one of the best guitarists that I've heard in a very long time. Um, so I took two lessons from him, started playing. My fingers hurt too much. I was complaining, so I put it down. I was like, I don't want to do lessons anymore. It's pointless and I wouldn't look forward to it. After like a few months, I like picked up my guitar again and was like, okay, like I can play this. And, like started looking up like ultimate guitar chords and like would look up songs that I liked. So the first song I ever learned was Sea of Love um, and Cat Power covered it. And I was so in love with it that I learned it on guitar. And once I knew how to play a song, I was like, oh my God, now I need to play more songs. And then I kind of like got sucked into the whole, I want to play music for the rest of my life kind of thing. For me, we're, we'll bypass the whole elementary school learning to play the recorder thing, because I don't count that. <laughs> but it was, I was in sec one and my grandmother had bought me like one of those like little Walmart guitar packs with the app and all that. Uh, I really, really wanted it. Friends in elementary had played guitar and like I always thought it was really cool. And then finally I got the thing and it was, it was weird because like I was terrible at first, <laughs> but it was like, it wasn't about, because I had no expectations going in. I was just like, I have this piece of wood with six metal strings on it, a cord to an amp, and I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know how to do anything, but I would hit something and it would make a noise. I'm like, okay, well, what if I do this? Then I'm like, okay, that makes a different noise. So it was kind of like an exploration thing where even though it sounded awful and my parents probably wanted to like throw the amp out the window and were like, grandma, why would you do this? Why would you do this to us? You hate us? Um, there was this curiosity with it. And that's something that I've always kind of kept where, cause I'm not theoretically like a super well-versed guitar player, but a big part of the way I either write or the way I play or try to like add to a song, it's kind of just trying to do things that I wouldn't, that wouldn't necessarily be like your first thought. It's just like, I have this thing in my head. I'm like, let me try to just figure out how to get there. And I might get there in a weird way that wasn't what I intended, but I figured it out somehow. And that was my whole exploration with the guitar in the first place. And then I learned Iron Man by Black Sabbath. <laughs> and that was that. When I was a teenager, um, I first heard Janis Joplin sing Peace of My Heart. And I was so flabbergasted by her vocals because they were raw and they were raspy and she didn't care. There's like the recording 
recording goes off on so many times and she's like out of pitch and she just is belting it the whole time, you know? Like growing up as a kid, I always had a raspy voice and teachers would always ask me if like I smoke or like indirectly be like, you shouldn't smoke. And I was like, I don't, that's just my voice. I mean, it's, it, it's tough, you know, growing up with that and stuff, which like now I'm super grateful for it. But that was like the first vocal that I ever heard that was raspy and powerful and I just felt really in tune with it and it kind of resonated with me and I was like, okay, I can work with this, this can be cool. And I think like that's where like my badass phase kind of came in because I was like, I'm like Janis Joplin. And you know, it obviously it, it stems to like a bunch of different um, powerful trailblazing women in like the rock and roll scene of that time. Like I said before, it started with Angus and ACDC, a bit playing, but more just the idea of the guitar. And then from there, once I started playing, there was guys like Slash and Guns N' Roses. What made me want to get up on a stage and play live was Motley Crue, just watching them, especially Nikki Six, the bass player. I've seen those old videos of him, how just kind of wild and out there he was. I was like, I like that's not bass, but I want to do that. So. Chase came out to a show that I was playing at K Dave Wim and we were talking about music there and then we ended up playing some songs at my house and he was going through a James Bay riff of the song uh, Hold Back the River I think you were playing. No, what started was I was playing uh, Room 5 She Will Be Loved actually. Oh yeah, he was playing Room 5 She Will Be Loved and he was playing like that total guitarist game of like everyone sings when I play this song, like his Wonderwall song, you know? Except I will so, not play Wonderwall. True. Won't do it. True. Nope. So he was playing a little guitar riff and I was washing dishes and then he started um, I was like oh we should put up a Facebook cover because why not like it'll be fun and then he started playing James Bay who is one of my favorite artists like he's tattooed on my ribs I he's influenced a lot of what I what I've written and just like helped me through some hard times he's like I can also play the song if you ever want to be in love I was like that's my favorite James uh, James Bay song like and yes mine too let's play it so yeah we, we did like one take of the James Bay song slapped it on the Chinsia Facebook page and People just loved it. Like maybe we play really well together. And then we met up again and I kind of like asked him to join the band. And it was super awkward because it feels like you're asking someone out, but you're not asking someone out. But there's still like that little bit of rejection that could come of like, oh no, your music isn't good enough for me to want to play it. And that's totally how I was too. Yeah. I was like, you know, like um, we're looking for a guitarist and like uh, I think like we play really well. If you think we play really well, like you can totally like we can play we can play some, we can play some shows. It doesn't have to be official or anything. We'll just like play some shows. Like, it was show, so awkward like, you know? <laughs> and he was like literally sitting on the couch like this like yo wait. sure sure cool. yeah. no. <laughs> let's play a song we'll do it so yeah, that came together. And then uh, Massimo was like at our shows. Massimo always loved like the kind of music that I was making and he was like, hey, I want to be a part of this. And which was amazing. Cause I was like, yeah, for sure. We're totally looking for a band and he can play drums. So we started practicing as a little threesome um, with vocals, guitar and drums. Like the guys were always saying like, oh, there's missing like a rhythmic element a hundred percent. There's something there that needs to come in. And I was like, whatever, it sounds like garage rock. I'm cool with it. And they were like, no, no, no. It's like, no, we need a bass player. Yeah, and Gina had just moved to Montreal and she was friends with one of my friends and she was saying, okay, this girl, Gina, just started working at the radio station. She doesn't have any friends in Montreal yet. Do you want to go hang out with her? And I ended up finding out that she's in a band called Altered by Mom. So we started talking music and it just like, we clicked right off the bat. And like, I love that she was like a female musician because I really like pulling in that like, let's, empower women because you know we need that in life so we're talking about music i was telling you we were looking for a bassist and she's like well i play bass i was like yo come to a practice i'm like well we'll see how it goes but she just like she just vibed with us that's and that's it. what was super important like she she understood the dynamic she fits so well with the dynamic and again it just kind of happened and we didn't force it and i think that's like the beauty of what comes with like making something creative that way so the marketing behind Chintzy and the Eclipse is basically um, a matter of trying to balance everything that we're doing, again, authentically, because I feel like everything we should be doing as Chintzy and the Eclipse needs to be something organic, needs to be something authentic that stays true to us, you know? Uh, so the way we market ourselves single-wise is more a game of longevity and the fact of, you know, kind of catering to, to an audience that's out there right now because, yeah, we're 100% doing ourselves and making our music for us, but we also do realize that 
we want other people to enjoy it too. And the fact of the matter is right now, the, the whole music industry is more of a singles kind of world, you know, and so far it's been playing in our favor. Every time we release a single, there's kind of like a lifespan for that single. So we can promote at that time, we can make different videos, and you know, by the time that kind of dies out, we have another single. I think playlists have been super kind to us when it comes to single releases as well, because they don't accept um, EPs or LPs. So every time we release a single, you know, Spotify has been amazing with us and always adds us to their like curated playlist so far and I hope I really hope that that continues because we really appreciate it and are super grateful yeah I think we're just we're playing the market to what what it's supposed to be and kind of catering it to what we do as artists you know which I think is important in the music industry you need to be able to take what's going on and kind of build it the way you need to for your product definitely I 100% think there's a strong relatability with uh, with the audience Again, especially when we play live shows, that's by far our favorite thing to do. There's a certain cycle that goes on with this project, with Chancing the Eclipse. Like, we'll, we'll play a show, people will resonate with it, they'll cry with us at times, they'll laugh with us, they'll sing with us. And then I'm, I'm truly grateful that I'm able to take that in and kind of bring it out again in another song. You know, and be like, okay, I, I like being relatable and I think it's a tough thing to reproduce. You want to stay relatable and reflective so people can see themselves within the song, but it's also an extremely personal process to, to songwrite, you know? So you're staying true to yourself and hoping that someone will relate to it. So the fact that they do and you're like, the fact that you say the lyrics are like gut-wrenching and heartfelt really is amazing. And I, again, I, I, I'm always at a loss for words when people tell me that because that's really all I want to do is have someone be like, I feel myself in that song. There's a lot going on. What I've always loved, especially coming from the South Shore, you know, being off island, having to cross bridges all the time to get to the place where the music is, because the music all goes on there. It's, it's the hub. For me, when I was younger in high school, especially, I always looked to the island because I would go see a few shows here or there. And it was what I always loved was like, I would start going around, walking around town and I'd see, oh, this bar has live music. Oh, this bar has live music. Oh, there's a club here. There's this here. I'm like, this is everywhere. And if you're not thinking about it, you'll walk past it and you'll never know. But when you start looking around, you're like, this stuff is everywhere. A scene out there for everything. Like you've got your metal scene, your rock scene, your punk scene, and you got more niche scenes within these ones. And there's some more indie stuff. There's some more pop stuff you got hip-hop stuff going on and it's what it always struck me as really cool was the fact that there was that diversity it's not just like oh Montreal's just this we have this but next door like you have your death metal band playing here and then the next door or the next night at the same place you've got an acoustic duo like that's for me that's what I've always loved with Montreal it's just you you, it's, you don't know what to expect you're gonna get something different every night I think the best way to describe it is like diverse and supportive because people are just excited to talk about the music that's out there you can even look at it as like us as a band as a microcosm mm -hmm. of that like we all come from these different influences and like say Massimo yeah. will talk about some of the music he listens to I'm like I've never heard of that then he's like check this stuff out or Chinsey yeah. and I will be talking like with Butch Walker I was like you need to hear Butch Walker you know <laughs> and then like you sent me stuff like early on you sent me Dua Lipa and stuff like that and I was yeah. like in that kind of pop side because like I've always liked some pop but because I'm not as out there looking for it all the time where it's like when I do find things especially like that I was like oh this is really interesting I like this direction so Chinsu would be like, oh, you got to check this out, Chase. And then Massimo would be like, oh, guys, check this yeah. out. So it's always this very interesting kind of, everybody's just very willing to share. And that's yeah, what's fun with it. Definitely. What's next for Chinsu and the Eclipse? Tours. Tours, lots of shows, new music. We're working on a lot of things right now. We really want to start putting out things aside from our music, like more music videos, get more artistic people involved as dancers, videographers, everything. I think we just want to grow in like a musical community, basically. So we really want to bring who we can in with us and like, you know, bring them for the ride and stuff. You know, we want, we want to grow as Canadian artists and, you know, cross over. <laughs>